purpose of this interview is to receive a full and comprehensive report on all the uses of Roundup, otherwise known as glyphosate, statewide by state, county, city departments, and agencies to determine whether all appropriate regulations, codes, safety measures, and guidelines are being fully observed in its use. We're receiving information today from environmental and health leaders, experts, on any potential hazardous effects of uh, Roundup and how it's used in the environment, uh, its impact on uh, human health as well. What we're going to do is we're going to start with um, just some technical information so people can better understand the chemical. Uh, we have some experts in this area to do that for us. People are going to uh, give presentations. We're also going to have an opportunity to explore possible alternatives to the use of chemical herbicides such as Roundup. Uh, by states, counties, cities, and agencies that are out there. So what I'd like to do then is to uh, get this update, um, receive the information from maybe three or four experts, then call up uh, our departments. We have multiple departments which we've invited uh, to give their perspective on what's going on in their county or their municipality. So basically it will give us kind of a, a, a guide to what this chemical is, how it's being used in the state, and then whether or not you know, we need to be uh, more focused on how we're using it, whether we have to start asking questions about whether this is the right chemical to use whatsoever, and what other um, recommendations from all of you would have for us. So we really welcome everyone's input, uh, but I so appreciate uh, the full room and people traveling to us uh, today. So everyone understand kind of the scope of how we'll go? Uh, Co-chair? Thank you, Senator Green. Uh, thanks, Sir Brian. I'm very glad that um, Senator Green called this hearing together. I share his concerns about glyphosate, um, and I'm glad we're bringing some of the issues to light. I know that glyphosate has had a reputation of being one of the safest chemicals for several decades, and but there has been some research come to light lately that casts some doubt on whether that's a, the right assessment of the product. I particularly was very moved by a presentation that I saw from Dr. Stephanie Seneff, a researcher from MIT, where she showed some of the research she's done correlating the increased use of glyphosate with the increased incidence of several illnesses around the nation, most prominently autism, and she has some very, very compelling evidence that I think, while it doesn't prove causation at the very least, would tell anyone there's a need for some serious study of this issue. Uh, so I know that it's been widely used in large part because of its great reputation for safety. And now that uh, the, sci the science is showing that that may not be such a well-deserved reputation, I think it's important that we take a good look at what we're using so much of so casually and whether it's the right thing to do. So thank you, Senator Green, for bringing this here to me. It's my pleasure. Um, one of the, one of the reasons that we're having this hearing, if I can be quite direct, is that uh, I, you know, I received correspondence from, goodness knows, lots of people around the globe, but right back from my own um, community in Kona, uh, a Big Island resident sent me these pictures, and I'll hold them up for you, which was um, a, a daytime, what looked like a basic routine spraying along the, the side of the road, but it also uh, did, did demonstrate, now someone would have to focus in on this, maybe other people on these slides, kind of a power hose being used along the side of the road. And this is quite near, uh, well, it's near the center of the population in our powerful metropolis of Kona. So you can imagine, uh, when people bring, you know, bring to light regular, real emails, I like to actually try to respond to people. And, um, you know, a lot of this, this one was near uh, the school and business district up there uh, in South Kona. So I just want to learn about what our protocol protocols are as a county, what our um, tendencies are for use of any chemicals. Today we're focusing on glyphosate, and I think we're going to be a kind of a better informed community as a result of this. So, why don't we start with um, uh, the Kona Water and Soil Conservation District um, uh, Executive Jeff Knowles? Can you come up, Jeff. Well, uh, folks. Um, oh, uh, this work? Uh, yes, and bring it a little closer to you, I think, is the best thing to do. We'll turn down the lights, I believe. You have a PowerPoint. I do, yes. Okay. okay. So give us, tell us your name when you come up, and sure. give us a little bit about your credentials, and then fire right. away. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak in front of me. And I do appreciate you bringing this issue to the public light. My name is Jeff Knowles. I'm a director with the Soil, called the Soil and Water Conservation District. 
the Coleman Stone Water Conservation is one of the six states of Iowa and multiple counties in the states of uh, the state of Nebraska, the Kona District of Hawaii, the Republic of Plow, Afghanistan, as well as uh, Washington, D.C. So my experience uh, with Ron goes back to the mid-1980s, um, working as a soil conservationist, coming out of Iowa State with a degree in agronomy. Soil erosion rates at that time were really quite high. Um, the decade of the 70s was a decade that feed the world. A lot of highly rotable lands got brought in production. Anyway, at the time, there were no um, mandatory rules for farmers to follow. Standard tillage operations were mobile plowing. So as a soil conservationist, our job was to work with farmers and try to help them develop ways to reduce soil erosion. So one of the tools that we tried to convince them of doing was switching from the mobile plow initially to the chisel plow and eventually no tillage. At the time, Paraquat was the primary herbicide that was used by farmers throughout the Midwest that were involved with reduced tillage operations. And sometime in the mid-80s, Roundup was um, in introduced as a way to help farmers reduce soil erosion. As a conservationist, uh, this was a very important tool, and it spread like wildfire. Quite honest, honestly, over the last 30 years on the mainland, and even Hawaii, I think there's been kind of a revolution of um, land improvement things that have happened. We've seen significant soil erosion reductions rate throughout the country. There's been millions of acres of wetlands restored, as well as, well as millions of acres of land reforested. When I accepted this point, one of the things I brought to the Soil and Water Conservation District last November was the counties and the states' use of herbicide. I had been uh, concerned about the counties and states' of use of herbicide for quite some time, but it wasn't until I got on this board that I was able to feel like I could do something about it. So we made the motion back in November to contact representatives from the state and the county that were involved in maintaining our roadsides. The motion was passed. We sent letters to both uh, the state and the county representatives. Before I go any further, I do want to stay, I want to thank our people, men and women who work for the county and the state of Hawaii. They're hardworking men. They are hardworking men and women, and I believe they do want do not want to do anything that will <coughs> negatively affect either uh, the environment or human health. And since that time, I met with uh, two of the key players of the Department of Transportation that involved with growth spraying. Um, we gave pretty much the same PowerPoint presentation, lacking a few of the al alternatives that I'll discuss at the end of this. My sense of the state is they're very uh, proactive in addressing this issue. Uh, one person is pretty much has to say whether or not any of his employees can spray Roundup. And what he told me is his attitude toward the use of Roundup is um, people, when they come to Hawaii, they like to see the way out. We lined up a meeting for the, for the Department of Transportation and the Hawaii County Public Works. For whatever reason, the individual with Hawaii County Public Works did not show up. However, my, they, have, they also have this information. My sense is they're beginning to address some of these issues. So, with that, concerns for Roundup usage in Hawaii County. This originally was a 45-minute presentation. I did knock it down to about 10 minutes, hopefully, because I know there are other speakers, and this will be a, a long session. Can I trouble you, sir, to get that link? Thank you. That's, uh, that's perfect. Yeah. I'm breaking all the rules of a good PowerPoint presentation. There's way too many bullets on here, I understand. But these are the general concerns that, in a nutshell, have brought up application on Hawaii County. And when I say Hawaii County, my real experience is in Kona, but I do believe this applies throughout the island. Number one, roundup application, typically mainland, especially in Hawaii. We got, we got weeds growing around year round. It's very difficult to be an organic farmer in Hawaii. I'm all about the wise use of anything, wise use of chemicals, particularly. But I, I, see, um, I see this as a big issue because um, we have farmers that are very conscious, <coughs> doing a very good job, <coughs> and we have farmers that do not want, want one blade of grass growing on their property. So those <coughs> farmers that I, I consider using that are what, what I would consider bad actors. We also have a number of residential properties where, I don't know if it's a cultural thing, I cannot figure it out, but I see a lot of residential properties in Kona with not one single blade of grass, continually spraying around it. And the same with business properties. This is not just a county and state issue, I believe it's a, an island-wide issue, and it extends from governments to the farmer, to business properties, to residential pro properties. In my opinion, and a lot of things I'm discussing today is my opinion and based on my 30 years experience with USDA. I believe that Roundup has the residue to build up in these areas. And when I say Roundup, the byproducts like glyphosate, however you pronounce it, I'm not really sure. On Hawaii Island, we have pretty much two kinds of soil, either ash or organic soils. And these soils don't have the, the water holding capacity. They can't tie up nutrients. They can't tie up chemicals like some of the clay soils on the mainland. 
And once again, in my opinion, I, I believe that we do have a high potential for leaching of nutrients and chemicals into the groundwater, into ocean water. <coughs> Number three. I also believe that over-application gets occurring throughout the Kona District by just about everybody who sprays around it. An example, best example I can come up with, a one-inch crack, for instance, on the sidewalk is sprayed with a 12-inch band of, of, from the applicator. You see it all the time. In some cases, no doubt, I have no doubt that roundup is, being, is too much roundup is being put in with the water. And way, a good way you can tell that, generally, if the mix is correct, you're going to see the weeds, weeds begin to die in three to five days. <clears throat> Many times I see spraying happening, weeds are dying within 24 hours. That tells me too much water is being put in, or too much rock is being put up with, with water. Now, this, um, this next one is based on my, what I could find in the label that Monsanto puts in that's with all, all the all ground up and sold. I don't know if you've ever checked out the label of, of, of Roundup, but it's very difficult to read. I honestly think lawyers put the darn thing together because it was very difficult to me to, for me to pull this out. I'm absolutely sure about this. But number one, and this, you know, and honestly, it says agricultural workers. Once again, my sense of Roundup was developed for agricultural production. I don't know if we've gone a little bit beyond that, but workers are supposed to be protected with clothing and gloves. But that's a no-brainer. And Roundup does not be applied when unprotected people are in the area. It shouldn't be applied when people might walk over right after it. I'll give you an example. I entered thousands of fields that had been sprayed with Roundup. As a federal employee, it was our, our policy to never enter a field that had been sprayed with Roundup for a minimum of 24 hours. We all had it on a sticker in our own, own health. But most of the labels, I believe, say four hours. <coughs> and do, avoid drift at all costs. Just don't let this stuff drift and it should not be implied in front of homes and businesses. Putting it lightly, and without accusing anybody of anything, in the Kona District of Hawaii, and I believe this probably you might say island-wide, over-application of Robert shows there is a great deal of education that needs to be done. There seems to be a general belief that Roundup is, is, is a safe herbicide, that it's like water. I, I, I can't quite figure it out what it is. One guy told me, you know, 50 years ago, when young men were growing up on coffee farms, they had to pick all these weeds by hand. And then when, uh, when some of these herbicides came about, and they, they thought they were safe, this, this attitude has, has stayed with them, many people until they've gotten older and they continue to spray. This is an example. Hawaii County uses a high pressure spraying system mounted in the back of a truck. And generally, the spraying operations is a minimum of 40 feet above the surface pointing straight down. A couple of things wrong with this picture. That spray, when it hits the, that's once again, the 12-inch band is hitting a, basically a one-inch uh, crack in the pavement. The worker doesn't have gloves, and you can see there's cars going by. I don't know if you've ever been in Kona when a spraying operation takes place. It's marked, Ron, I mean, you can see the truck, but um, people are driving by these areas, by, by these trucks. Every day, any time they're spraying, these are on, these are on the, the state and county highways. This is difficult to see, but you can see the, the workers holding a, a sprayer, but also there's three attached um, spray nozzles that's on that. On the left-hand side of the road, you can see some sparse, little parcels of grass coming up, um, maybe covering about 25% of the soil on the surface. That entire area was sprayed. This is just an example of overspraying that I believe is occurring. Now, it is interesting, um, the, this where I don't know if this is a county or a state worker, but he is wearing a respirator. However, he doesn't have gloves on. He doesn't have a long sleeve shirt on. It's a basic rule. On Mamalo Highway, Kuakini, Napapo Road, and other county roadways throughout the county district, the spraying operator sprays around at a distance of 50 feet from the vehicle and 10 feet above the surface. This is a problem, and in my opinion, this is breaking what's set forth in the label instructions. Last um, June, I was riding my motorcycle on the new bypass road from um, Kailua Kona up to Kealakekua. And I seen uh, the spraying, it was quite a, quite a crew of county workers, and they were spraying on the Kai side of the road, and I noticed that they were spraying, it, same like this. They were spraying at quite a distance. I got missed it, I was very upset. My entire career in working in Iowa and Wisconsin, other places, I had never been sprayed. So I called the county worker when I got back to my home 20 minutes later, too late to take a shower and wash it off. 
and I, I, you know, I knew the guy. I said, hey, no name mentioned here, but um, I just drove by an operation and I got sprayed. His response was, well, Jeff, don't worry, it's just Roundup. Hmm. I say that not to, not to degrade the county worker at all, but just to say that that shows the amount of lack of education that, that I really feel is needed. So, motor vehicle operators, passengers, motorcyclists, bicyclists, and people walking or jogging are in many cases being exposed to the herbicide because of wind drift. Adults and children walking along roadways are also exposed to the herbicide before it's drying. Pretty much all the roadways in Kona, whether it be the high, the state highways, the county highways, they're, they're the walkways. That's where people walk. There's no other place to walk. And the county, I cannot say the state for certain. Once again, my experience of mainly observing the county, they use Roundup with the same techniques in many residential areas. The street, the residential area I live in, KAK Street. They'll come down there once every three months, they'll spray. And I, I see that the parents see the trucks coming, come on kids, get inside. Truck goes by, the kids are right outside. They're right, right when they're done spraying, they're out right in it. Nothing, nothing is marked. So, you know, adults, and unsuspecting adults and children, they do walk over these areas with immense of spraying. I, I've seen it many times. In addition, I have no question that drift in these kind of situations have the potential in their homes. Because once again, they're using the high pressure spraying, spraying at distances with a very fine mist, very difficult to come up with a day where there's no wind in Kona. We get with high winds coming up the ocean every day. Might not be windy in one area, you go, go a mile further, it's going to, you're going to have a wind gust come up. So in addition to the Hawaii County and State Department of Transportation use of the herbicide, Roundup is used extensively throughout the county districts by farmers, ranchers, landscapers, and businesses. As I mentioned, um, I do not believe we should, we should ban Roundup. I don't believe we should. It would have a devastating effect on our farmers. I believe that we do need a very strong education program. Same with ranchers. Most of the ranchers in Kona that I've noticed, they use rock along the roadside to go to their Malka Fort or to their Malka lands. And what I see many times is um, the invasive species that so often invade our native forest come from the roadways. So we, the ranchers also, they, they, need, they need a herbicide like Roundup to make sure that some of these invasive species don't go into their, to the forest that they maintain and they respect. They totally understand the value of our forest. Credit to the farmers, credit to the ranchers. As I said before, we have farmers who are very conscientious. They try to spray very little. Then we have others that they have this mentality. Any blade of grass on the property is bad. Landscapers, same thing. I observe landscapers time after time spraying a, a one-inch crack, spraying a few weeds, covering maybe 25% of the soil they're trying to, to uh, take care of. And they'll go over it once, twice, three times. In front of a bank, I've seen a guy spraying. Ten, or ten minutes later, a grandpa and a girl, a little girl, come along. The girl's picking up the rocks. So you know, once again, I, I think the real problem is education. Um, they got this mentality that roundup it cannot cause any harm. As I said, I, I do believe there does appear to be a general lack of understanding on requirements, and these are the big ones in my mind: avoiding drift, protect the operator, and I do believe the state is the state is all over that protecting the operator. No question about it. The state also, they've told me that they've reduced Roundup herbic or herbicide usage on the Big Island by 50%. And they want to reduce further. Number one, it costs 100 bucks a gallon. The county, the same thing. They also, I believe, do want to re um, reduce the amount of herbicide. There's no notice to the public not to enter, enter areas recently sprayed. <clears throat> so um, I guess in closing, what I really feel is needed more than anything, more than legislation, I believe we need education. Um, I believe the weakness we have in Hawaii, quite honestly, is the entity that can help with the education program, the Hawaii Association of Conservation Districts, which the Kona District is one of them. We have never in Kona received one dollar from the state to, you know, to do what other associations around the country. I, I do believe Hawaii probably is kind of at the bottom of the barrel. I mean, every state has an association of conservation districts. Many of them have very strong funding from the state. Many get funding from a variety of other sources. We're going to make an effort in Dakota to try to you know, screw up some of the grant money that's available. But, um, and I think we'll be successful. We just need to put some time and effort into it. At some point in time, I do believe, too, that the state could help the districts and, and could help us with education programs of this. We have more problems than just the use of Roundup in Hawaii. I don't need to tell anybody that. I think everybody recognizes that. What we sometimes don't recognize is, is there are entities in place um, that can address these issues. The districts, 
we have people that we know the community, we know the farmers. So I, I, that's not why I'm here. I'm not making, making making a pitch for you know financial assistance. I'm just saying uh, <coughs> this this is where I'm coming from. I do believe we can do something about it immediately. When we um when we started this back in November, we made the decision before we go public with this. Let's talk to the folks within the state. Let's talk to our county county, county first, and then let's go public. Let's try to start you know outreaching to the farmers and the ranchers. We don't we don't want to we don't want to say anything bad about the county workers or the state workers. They're not they're honestly they're not trying to harm anybody. I think this information that was presented to them was a bit of a surprise to them, and they're, but they're learning. So this is a learning process for all of us. So. With patience and uh, some effort, I believe we can re we can help to uh, reduce some of that potential negative environmental as well as um, human health concerns. So, pending any questions, I'll, I'll retire. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for coming. Why don't we do this? Um, we've got multiple people that are going to come and make comments. Um, and so we'll go through uh, the many individuals, and if you're available, we'll, sure. we'll see if there are questions Sounds at the end. Good. And I'm not sure how to shut this off. We'll cool work on it. Right on. Thanks, <laughs> guys. Yeah, uh, before we go into the next uh, presentation, set the lights off. Um, so we had, I did inquire about volume, and we received from, uh, we did we put out an inquiry to the counties, and in 2010, uh, 27,000 uh, mixed gallons of um, glyphosate were applied. So it was 27,000 gallons and then 23,000 gallons in 2011 and so forth. It, uh, it was decreasing um, and we'll probably get some specifics from some of the county individuals too. So um, that was very helpful, Jeff. Uh, I think what we'll do now is move to um, Dr. Andrea Rosenoff. She is uh, Director of Science Research and Science Information Outreach at Center for Magnesium. Uh, so we have to just have to that out of the side there and get you teed up. Yeah, okay, while well, she's getting ready, I'll just tell you a little bit about who I am and kind of how I got here. Um, I am uh, a nutritionist, a nutrition researcher, and I am the director of research and science information outreach at the Center for Magnesium Education and Research. What that means is I'm an independent scholar. I have my PhD in nutrition, and, um, and I worked in, in uh, the corporate world as an information analyst, a chemical information analyst. So very early on I started into the scientific databases and that was my job. I use that now to explore the peer-reviewed science on magnesium nutrition and all aspects of it. And in the context of that, um, I've published some papers sometimes and I was invited to a couple of international agricultural conferences and that's in the last couple of years, and that's when I learned about glyphosate from the farmers and from the agricultural chemists uh, that I spoke with. And there was concern about this. What I learned about it was that it was a metal chelator that was its first patent. And so because I thought, oh, it might be affecting magnesium, I started a research program around it. And I started gathering. What that means is I was gathering information from the peer-reviewed literature that I search all the time. Um, then on the Big Island, Bill 113 came up, and since I had some information, I put together a, a little one-pager for the county council that what I hope would help them, because my concern was overuse of glyphosate, um, and just being acknowledged about that as part of uh, the overall nutrition of our community, our nation, and the whole world. Okay? Okay. So, um, I want to start out with just an overview of how widely is glyphosate studied, and these are some, some searches that I did just this last week. I looked for the search term glyphosate in PubMed and in ScienceDirect, and ScienceDirect is the database uh, that is at the UH system um, in their library, online system. And you can see that 1,715 hits for glyphosate in PubMed. Um, and then over 7,000 in Science Direct. And, and that's a lot. To read 1,700 or 7,000, you know, it takes a long time. That's a lot of information. But I want everybody to see that I also did a search for cholesterol and diabetes in, in PubMed for the same time frame. Because the first glyphosate hit in PubMed is in 1975. So I limited the cholesterol and diabetes searches from 1975 to the present. You see the cholesterol has almost 200,000 references to it. Diabetes is 400, over 400,000 in the same time period. So you see 
that really uh, this, this particular chemical in terms of human health um, and in agricultural health, which would be included in Science Direct, agricultural health and environmental health also, um, is not uh, studied anywhere near as some of the common uh, concerns in health that we have in our nation. Um, and here's a little bit of the history of the use of glyphosate. If this is in the United States. You can see from the 70s, as Jeff said so beautifully, uh, that it was used as no-till. Uh, the farmers could come and they could spray it around on their farms before planting the crops, get rid of all the weeds. They didn't have to plow, meaning they didn't get soil erosion. They didn't have to drive their plows around and use all that petroleum. It was seen as a real win-win that we were not contributing to global warming, and here was this safe chemical, and it was just great. And you can see the use of it started to really go up, 92, 94. Um, it, it really became a very popular thing. The farmers just loved it. With the arrival of the glyphosate-resistant crops in 96, 97, I believe the first one was soy, you can see that it skyrocketed. These, this is used in the United States. You would see a, a similar one to globalist because the farmers absolutely love this technology. I talked to them at some of these farmers' farms that I went to, and they just love the technology. It's, it's easy. They, in their minds, it's safe. It, they, it gives a big crop with um, not having to go out and weed. And, and so this... This chemical, which has been seen as, talked about, the herbicide or the pesticide of the century, in fact it is, it's been seen as safe, it's, uh, also the patent went out uh, around the same time, and so uh, many manufacturers from around the world started producing it, and so the price of it went down in the market, which made it even more, uh, more likely that farmers would want to use it, and so the use of it is, is really, so what I want to talk to you a little bit is about uh, things that have been assumed about glyphosate and what I have found in the peer-reviewed science about that more recently. The first one is that glyphosate is biodegradable with a short life in the soils. And I remember people telling me in the 80s, oh, it's completely biodegradable. And what that meant to me was you spray it on and by three to five days later, there's nothing left. There's nothing unnatural left. It's biodegraded, it's not hurting our soils, it's not hurting our animals, it's not hurting us, it's not hurting our plants, it's not hurting our environment. What a wonderful thing, especially after DDT, when we were all so frightened of it, and they were measuring the DDT in mother's milks and all those things, and it was finally banned. The idea that we had a absolutely safe herbicide that we could spray onto our gardens, or onto our roadsides, or onto our farms, with absolute impunity, thinking that we were not harming anything, and we could go home and not have to do all that weeding. Oh my gosh, what a boon. I mean, who wouldn't love it? And I bought into it. I think a lot of people buy into it. But unfortunately, it's not completely true. Glyphosate is microbiologically metabolized to a compound called AMPA. And AMPA does have some herbicide qualities to it, but it's much less toxic to plants than is glyphosate. Now, the AMPA, from what I can learn, is presumed to break down into carbon dioxide, phosphate ion, and nitrate ion that would be bound up to minerals in the soil. But I have not seen an article that goes into the breakdown of AMPA. I think it might be presumed. It doesn't mean it isn't there. I'm still looking for it. In other words, I'm not sure the fate of AMPA at this point. What does that turn into? But the idea that it was biodegradable was its glyphosate is microbiologically being degraded into something called AMPA, so therefore it's completely biodegradable. Um, and both AMPA and glyphosate can remain in the soil for long durations. And I give this 1989 um, reference here that they had found durations of one to two years, and now we're finding durations in the, in the peer-reviewed literature of much longer, up to over a year. The next one, glyphosate and AMPA, even if they are kept in the soil, even if they do stay there for a long time, they're held so tightly by the soil particles that they are inert, and this makes them completely safe. Well, what we're finding is, uh, is that phosphorus can cause deabsorption of the glyphosate from the soil particles, which will reactivate it. Um, this is just a 2011, 2011 study. And in soils, then when we have phosphorus from fertilizer is added, or even from manure, 
if there is glyphosate attached to the soil particles in the soil, then that phosphorus could desorb it and reactivate it. So in our road signs, you could spray a lot of glyphosate in it, get rid of your plant, have it remain in the soil, and then if you go and plant some flowers or something like that, and you put some phosphate fertilizer on it, it that could, in fact, reactivate the glyphosate. And it's an, it's an untargeted effect, an untargeted effect. And in animals, there's concern at this point is that uh, phosphorus, which we eat, phytate is a phosphorus compound in uh, whole grains, and the GI tract, and there's um, phytase is an enzyme that breaks that up in human and animal GI tracts, that might um, phosphorus in the GI tract reactivate glyphosate that is in fact uh, held on to um, particles that have deactivated it before, and might this then, it's antimicrobial activities, because glyphosate not only kills plants, it also kills some, not all, bacteria. And so the idea is that it would disrupt the flora and fauna of the GI tract of animals and of human beings. Um, that's a lot of speculation at this time. It needs a lot more research, as you can tell. It's a very complex issue. Yeah, that, I guess I, I was going to interrupt, interrupt you just slightly. So, I mean, that is obviously an issue that comes up. Um, the, uh, I guess the, um, the flora in what we eat, of course, is always an issue. But um, GI bacteria has been kind of a perpetual concern over the last couple of decades. And I don't know, because you've done some literature, extensive, extensive literature searches, have you come across any uh, concerns that have been brought up about um, this circumstance about glyphosate in the GI tract or spikes in GI disease or anything of the sort? Well, there is, there is, um, it, it's a difficult one, Josh, because as you know, uh, it's like, are these really happening? Our population is growing and it's aging at the same time. But there is, seems to be more um, celiac sprue being diagnosed, which was, Celiac sprue has been a nutritional disease for a very long time, but it was always seen as very, very rare. We learned about it, of course, but not it wasn't a widespread thing. Um, and there seems to be more and more diagnoses of that for whatever reason. Now, what could that be? So many things. Because our diet is changing. The uh, micronutrients that are in our diets are also uh, not, are processed a lot out of our food. And so there's nutritional aspects as well as toxicity aspects that are going on. And also the whole flora and fauna of the GI tract, I remember people studying that when I was back in graduate school, a hard thing to study, very difficult, complex thing to study. But I think we're just now beginning to have the tools to start to study it in earnest, so it's a great big area that we really know practically nothing about. We know it's important now. For a long time, we didn't pay any attention to it at all, you know? So, okay. Um, another one, because the residual glyphosate in the soil is in fact tightly adhered to soil products, it does not run off into surface and groundwater, so we don't have to worry about that. Well, there's some new studies, as you can see the references down there, pretty much 2013, 2014. Surface and groundwater glyphosate and amplops have found in Switzerland, Canada, Argentina, New Zealand, France, in seawaters of Australia, and in air and rain of the Mississippi Delta. And in the Argentina study, which was very comprehensive, um, they did find, and, and in Argentina, the glyphosate resistant crops have been really in very high use for a long time. So that's a very good place to look at. And it turns out that the cultivated soils have anywhere from 35 to 1,500 micrograms per kilogram of glyphosate in them, <coughs> meaning there's a great, great big variety, great big spread probably uh, have to do with when they were last applied, how long they were applied, and so on. Same with AMPA, a large range like that. In the um, suspended particulate matter that are in the waters and the streams, 67% of them had, of their samples had glyphosate in them. And in the stream sediment, 66 to 88% had, uh, of the samples had glyphosate or AMPA in them. Now the surface waters had only 15 or 12 percent of the samples that were collected have either glyphosate or AMPA. And as I say, this is a high use area, Argentina. But 15 and 12 percent is not zero. It isn't like, okay, we, glyphosate is taken up by these soil particles, it, therefore don't worry about the surface waters. 
Well, it, it's true. They are taken up by those, and they're held, and they're deactivated by that. But to, it's not zero. In other words, the high use is they are getting into some surface waters, and as um, Jeff so well said, that the clays on the Big Island, all those, ha those properties have to do with how porous the soil is and how much glyphosate it can take in and when it rains and it gets, the, the speculation on this now is, is that when the soils get really, really wet, they cannot take in and hold, the soil particles cannot get, hold on to the glyphosate and at that time if there's a heavy rain, there will be wash off of these chemicals. Well, this was one of the, last, in last year's testimony, in a line of uh, questioning, this came up, and um, the, the general, just for people who weren't there last year, um, the, the line of questions <coughs> went like this. Do we use it um, in areas, someone mentioned that we only really are spraying where there's no water, and I said, well, there are some pretty rainy areas. There's Hilo, there's Kauai, and there's some very heavy rains, and isn't that a concern? And there was no, we didn't have any data, so I hope to hear from individuals from the county that we can today about that. And it was also my understanding that, um, I can't recall at the moment which, which country it was in, in Europe, but it was a country with very heavy waterways that had decided to ban uh, the use of the chemical. And their rationale was that they were seeing, they had heavy waterways that were um, very exposed to the spray, where there, there wasn't even a soil-based area, it was direct to waterways, and then, and I don't know if you have any information about that. It might have been the Switzerland study right there, it's there, and I will get that to you, okay? Sure. And that might have been, there were two big studies in Switzerland, and they, they, they essentially proved, they said, that conclusively, that this was appearing in the surface waters, and in groundwaters too. There's been some evidence that it's in groundwater also. But these are just the beginnings of it. Like I say, look at the years here, 2013, 2014. This is just, uh, for a long time, we've assumed that this holding on to the soil particle is not going on. You know? And so it's just something, it's just new information for us. Um, for, okay to go on? Yes. Okay. Glyphosate is not harmful to humans or animals in any way. If only this were true. Um, uh, there are several reports of harm from suicide attempts. and. Uh, they, the, many of them, some, a few of them die, uh, many of them end up coming right back. Their cardiovascular system, their kidney system, their respiratory systems are affected, but then they, they come back. They're okay. But the thing is, they, so, they don't take just the glyphosate. They take the glyphosate plus in a formulation which has surfactants with it. And in all the toxicological studies that I have seen, uh, reports on this, the toxicity of the formulations are much higher toxicity to tadpoles and fish and bees and whatever than is the pure chemical glyphosate. And so there's a regulatory thing here is have the <coughs> required toxicity studies for each and every formulation been done? Do we have that information? Yes, we have the short uh, traditional studies on toxicology on glyphosate. Um, but I don't believe that we have all the ones on the formulations, and so there's a, that's a big deal. Now, some of the ideas have been, well, the surfactants that are used to formulate glyphosate are just like detergents, and we are putting detergents into our environment and on our hands and on our dishes and everything else all the time, so what's the problem? Uh, there seems to be some kind of combination in it that is causing some toxicity that is seen in fish, that is seen in tadpoles and stuff. Um, and also, when a human being drinks a bottle of it, or even 500 mLs of it, they end up in the hospital with some pretty serious stuff. Um, there also had are very recent reports of harm and even death in agricultural workers. Um, Sri Lanka, I think, is, might be considering a ban on it, El Salvador and Panama. What I have heard is that there's, in the Sri Lanka, it is a kidney disease of unknown etiology, and there's controversy of what is causing this. Of course, a disease like that takes a long term to figure out what's happening. You know, you find it in a certain pocket, it takes a long time and a lot of research to have it. And remember my first slide, there's not a lot of research going on with this substance. Are these countries, um, were they heavy users? Is that why they stood out as far as potential harm to workers? Yes, El Salvador, I have a report from uh, Dr. Don Huber who says that 25% of their agricultural workers who have been for two years working on a glyphosate-resistant sugar beet crop, that 25% of them are dying. 
And so that's why there's concern there. And Panama, a certain uh, similar situation. In Sri Lanka, there has been this kidney disease of unknown etiology for some time. And just recently, they've been talking about uh, perhaps it is a hard water issue coupled with the glyphosate or whatever. It's one of those sticky things that is going to take a lot of discussion and a lot of research to figure out. Um, but I think at this point, remember then also, that this herbicide is at very high use, higher than any other herbicide. Because why? Because it is so much, in fact, safer than all those other herbicides that are in the arsenal that have been around for a long time, but there haven't been any new herbicides really for about 30 years. And so this is what the farmers have got. This is what the county governments have got. This is what the gardeners have got. Unless we want to go out and start weeding again, which I none of us want to do. I mean, you know, I don't want to. I don't know of anybody who wants to go and weed like that, although I think our organic farmers do. But we have to look at some of these things. I'm kind of hoping for the day when we have robots that are going to come and do all the weeding for us and we can get out of this chemical thing we're in, you know, because obviously the earth, uh, there's a lot of us here on, on planet earth, we need to feed ourselves, but we also need to not harm our environment and Hawaii of course is so special with our special soils and all of our, uh, you know, different ecosystems all in one place, you know, the, the potential for drift is different than in Iowa or in the, the plains where most of this research has been done. Dr. This, Dr. Dr. Rosam, I'm gonna, we've been at about 20 minutes, so I'm going to have to ask you to I'm going to. Push, yeah. The last thing on this big thing, this is just all the <clears throat> possible unintended things. Oh, the other thing is, even though glyphosate uh, is not supposed to be in the surface waters or anything, uh, in back in the 1980s or early 90s, um, no uh, glyphosate was found in humans, in urine or in blood, and now they're finding it in human blood and human urine. Okay, the one I want to go down to is just at the very end, the emergence of glyphosate-resistant weeds. Uh, it's in such overuse, the farmers prefer it over every other herbicide, and as a result of its high sustained use, there is the evolution of uh, glyphosate resistant weeds and this is going to be a big problem for our food supply production. But what are our farmers going to do? I do not know if Hawaii is in a situation of overuse like that, but with our in, uh, precious species and our invasive species, this is a complex area that we have to think about too, is we do not want to, we don't need any more glyphosate resistant or herbicide resistant weeds on our big island. And so then I just have the references for all this stuff, which I'm glad to give to anybody. I just go back two slides. Tell me how to go quality. back. Oh, well, let me try this. I go forward to go back. All right, there we go. So possible teratogenic activity. So you, you mentioned amphibians and birds, and I, we had had some of those studies discussed um, obliquely in previous hearings. But I just, have we done, has there been any human research? Have we had any connections to any um, birth defects. People are talking about it being an endocrine disruptor, and they are being proposed. But again, these are, um, there seems to be some evidence, but they are not in any peer review studies that I have found yet. People are talking about it. Do they have the funding to do these studies? Probably not. And there's a dearth of, of actual studies that really need to be done that could, should have been good, happening all this time for some reason. It's not been an area of highly active research. And um, I haven't seen any ones on humans. I have seen reports of birth defects showing up in Latin America and one in Washington State and speculation that this is in fact be from overuse of glyphosate. We will have um, we will have the director of health. We don't hold anyone today at this point to you know to the full scientific uh, uh, literature, you know, and a full assessment of it. But I think that um, one of the issues and I'm so appreciative of your time today. One of the issues that's come up repeatedly has been uh, from community members have, have been how are we assessing, and this is not apropos necessarily of today's hearing, how are we assessing <coughs> changes and fluctuations in birth defects? And um, when we see clusters, how are we able, from the Department of Health, a statewide standpoint, able to assess them? And, and some of these questions perhaps can be addressed over time. And uh, you know, one of the main points today is, is we first, when we had Jeff up here, he was speaking, I think, pretty exclusively about proper use and education and 
you've spoken quite eloquently about the properties, um, but the potential hazard question, I guess, is where ultimately, as a physician, I like to to take the discussion. Um, we, in my committee, like to use the you know the, the precautionary principle to a degree. Uh, we like to have research. So, um, as you continue your work, we'd like to have updates um, from you on studies and so on. But we'll try to aid you in the work. Absolutely. And, um, and just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not there. Keep that in mind. If I, just because I haven't seen a human study on it doesn't mean it isn't there. One other thing I have thought about, I uh, wanted to suggest that monitoring, a monitoring program in Hawaii is certainly uh, something to be done with all the chemicals that are going into our environment and coming out of our urban things. The one that was done in New Zealand, for example, that found the glyphosate in their waterways. They found, um, they did concentrations of flame retardants, plasticizers, alkyl phenols, herbicides, pesticides, steroid estrogens, pharmaceuticals, and heavy metals. They did a, a widespread thing in their sampling that they had. Because remember that these are in combination going into not just our drinking water and our aquifers, whatever, but also into our environment. And we, I think that legislators are going to need to have information to know what to do. Is there regulation needed? And I think that there's a definite place for government in all of this uh, as we proceed, working together with industry and with farmers and with people. Um, but you're going to have to have real information of your area to be able to make some sound decisions. And that Hawaii really is a great place because on you've got these different islands that have had different histories of these different chemical uses, especially the pesticides and stuff. And so, in a way, you might be able to get become a center for using this, which the whole world needs this information. Um, you could get a big grant that would um, that Hawaii State and maybe the federal government and maybe even WHO could go in together and say, let's find out what what these chemicals are doing in all these different environments of Hawaii and bring to, bring this information to the whole world. That would be very helpful. Thank you for your time today. Appreciate it. We're going to continue forward and then uh, we'll have questions. Uh, next, I have Jennifer Apple. Our pal. Next slide, please. My apologies to everyone. I'm going to um, start pushing people to go to at least closer towards 10 minutes. Sorry about that. No, not at all. It's, it's good. Um, okay. I yeah. just realized you have your own laptop. Sorry to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, our friends. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. My name is Jennifer Pell. Jennifer, I you am have a. To, you have to sit down and speak to us. We're televising. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a registered landscape architect. Um, my background is in civil engineering. My patents are in architecture for how to build houses that make their own power and water. I was certified soil food advisor number two, and uh, apparently, according to my USDA certifying agent, I am the only USDA certified organic farmer that is adjacent to Syngenta Ag, with additional neighbors Monsanto and Pioneer Hybrid. So, but doctor, I would be the one that is out there pulling weeds by hand. <laughs> uh, I have tons of. We can. Uh, yeah, Do you have we'll a PowerPoint? Hmm? Do you have a PowerPoint? Do you have a PowerPoint that you'd like to? I have a bunch of PDFs, so example. I think you can put it right into that side, so. Uh, we can do it into this computer. Okay. Then we'll. I was going to say, you have someone else that can. Computer to load and get all the information off of it. First of all, I'd like to say that I, I believe, Jeff, in that people who use Roundup are not bad people. I used to use it. We used it in our landscape company in Texas. We also had to make sure that everyone who was applying the material was color nicely tested to. Uh, You can give us your overview and then when the 
the slides come up, that's no problem. Dr. Melissa Yee. I'm from the group Seeds of Truth, and uh, I've been in contact with uh, Dr. Stephanie Sena, who is from MIT, and uh, together we've held several panels talking about the uh, dangers of, of Roundup. And she has uh, published two papers um, uh, together with um, Dr. Samsell, and one of them is uh, glyphosate's uh, suppression of cytochrome P4 uh, 50 enzymes, an amino acid biosynthesis by the gut microbiome pathways to modern diseases, uh, which was published in Entropy um, magazine in 2013, and the other one was uh, glyphosate pathways to modern diseases, celiac screw and gluten intolerance, uh, published also in 2013. So I um, have forwarded the, um, the PDFs to your office and I think you have them on record. But she is uh, generally saying uh, here in this email, I am a senior research scientist at MIT, and I also have a second home in Kauai. I have been very involved in the issue of pesticide applications and GMO crops in Hawaii, and have been giving, talk, giving talks on three occasions in Oahu for presenting evidence for the toxicity of glyphosate. Uh, my recent research has led me to strongly believe that glyphosate is the most significant toxic chemical in our environment today, and that it is the main contributor to the alarming rise in many serious diseases and conditions, including autism, obesity, Alzheimer's disease, uh, kidney failure, and various digestive disorders, particularly celiac disease, together with Anthony Samsell, I have written two peer-reviewed papers explaining how the known biological effects of glyphosate can explain the known pathogens associated with these diseases. Um, she attaches a draft of a paper which she is writing for a journal for the general public. As you are surely aware, the Sri Lankan government has just banned the use of glyphosate in the entire country. As a consequence of studies which have confirmed that glyphosate the active ingredient in Roundup is the principal cause of the epidemic of kidney failure in agricultural workers. El Salvador has also banned glyphosate for the same reason as the previous uh, speaker mentioned in her PowerPoint. Um, she also says here, the U.S., despite spending over twice as much on health care as other industrialized nations, has a dismal and steadily worsening record on infant mortality and our children suffer from a large number of debilitating conditions, including autism, ADHD, asthma, food allergies, obesity, um, etc. Uh, diabetes, obesity, digestive disorders, and kidney failure are also sharply on the rise throughout the population in step with the increased use of glyphosate on corn and soy crops. I believe that glyphosate as the most significant fact is the most significant factor contributing to these problems. Um, contrary to Monsanto's claims, glyphosate is toxic to humans in part because it kills off beneficial bacteria in the gut and allows pathogens to flourish, but also because it depletes essential amino acids, cages rare minerals, and disrupts the function of important enzymes in the liver needed for fat metabolism, detoxification of poisons, vitamin D activation, and many other important roles. Many of the complex pathologies associated with autism and celiac disease can, can be easily explained by the known toxic effects of glyphosate, which is now sprayed on wheat and many other crops right before the harvest. Um, Hawaii has a chance to play a leadership role here. So um, I, I don't have the PowerPoint available, but uh, you can refer to that. I, and I'm sure it'll be similar to what the other people have presented today. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. I think so. You can help her.
material safety data sheet for glyphosate? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm leaving this in for reference for you so, so that you, we're using the 41% by weight. And it tells you all the things that you should know about glyphosate. It's handling storage, it's used. This by law is required for every single CAS number that any type of pesticide, chemical, it, it tells you all the hazards to it, all the data in which the government uses to make a determination. This is the 41 page new label that the Hawaii Department of Agriculture just approved for the latest glyphosate 4 plus, which is 41 percent. It is 41 pages long. It tells you do not apply to water to areas where surface water is present or Inner tidal areas below the mean high water mark. Do not contaminate water when cleaning equipment or disposing of equipment washers. Um, if you use it in your steel, it will produce a hydrogen gas that is highly combustible. It talks about don't use it under drought conditions. And then it goes into a whole series of what you can do to add with other chemicals in order to make it more effective for these super weeds that we were talking about earlier. I'll leave this one for I don't know that we can get anything from it at that speed. So what would you like us to take away from uh, this, you know, this document? The new list is 41 pages of information about how to use an inappropriate product appropriately. Everybody in here has had a weed, a dandelion in the crack of pavement, and we've gone out and we've used the Roundup, and we spray it on there, and we go, wow, wow, it, it, it's gone. Only like two weeks later, all of a sudden, it comes back, right? So apparently, the glyphosate's not really working. It's only a temporary solution, and we know this. In fact, College of Tropical Agriculture is still telling us that we should be able to use glyphosate because it's relatively non-hazardous and how to use it in order to use it as a foliar spray or a basal bark spray or for cutting stumps or for injection for trees and taking in order to get rid of unwanted weeds or pests. How do we do it on that side? How do I do it on the bottom? profile for sugar cane in Hawaii, which was prepared in 2000, but this is based on research that was done at one time this place is a volcano and over time we developed more bacteria and more fungi and things grew. Glyphosate actually selects for anaerobic bacteria, anaerobic fungi. It allows for disease causing pathogens to grow and it removes all the good guys. All the guys that would stabilize erosion, all the guys that put taste in all the guys that suppress diseases. So from the function of selling a product that actually promotes the use of other chemicals and knocks back the natural progression of soil and soil organisms, it's fantastic because it tries to keep things the way they are. Guinea grass 
is the reason why we actually use the most Roundup here. And yet, in that sugar cane, if I can get the sugar cane to show up, what we found was that it doesn't work. Glyphosate is actually a terrible product for trying to get rid of guinea grass, which is the main reason that we use it. It's not for pests, it's not for diseases, it's to get rid of unwanted weed species. And a weed is just nature's way of fixing a nutrient deficiency in the soil so that the continuation of species can occur. I have a video that's up on YouTube that I would love to pull up that actually shows places at my farm where we use soil biology in order to remediate guinea grass so that it doesn't grow. Instead of having guinea grass we have, and there's guinea grass right beside it, it's flowering. So, and, and putting out seed. There's no reason to use a product that you have to use over and over and over again when we could have a permanent solution that is non-toxic, safe for the environment, that actually increases the bulk density in the soil, stops erosion, stops the off-gassing. Data that I pulled up here, and I actually have every one of those presentations that you were referencing, I have them right here. Every single one of these. So, so when we get done, I'm going to have you wrap up, and then we'll add your uh, information into the, so I have a, multiple other speakers, I'm sorry. So, well, the state stays in the soil here for up to 22.8 years. There's no reason to use it every 60 to 90 days. It's guaranteed, even by Monsanto's research, to stay here for 180 days. It binds in soil particles because the biology does not get a chance to break down. It only works best on leaves. Once it hits the soil, it's absolutely completely useless. Less than 1% of glyphosate is taken by roots. It's all taken in by the leaves of the plant. Once it hits the ground, then it runs off because you killed all the fungi that would stop erosion. So when everything runs down, that's why we have chocolate being chocolate on the North Shore. Here? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. All the erosion that runs off. That's where the glyphosate goes. I have studies showing that it takes upwards of three years for it to break down in water supplies where it was used off of Australia and this, the studies that they looked at, how well it breaks down or doesn't break down, and it requires soil microbes in order to break it down. The anaerobic soil microbes are the ones that are selected for with the use of the product, and those are the ones that cause the diseases, which is why we have phytophthora, why we have brown patch, why we have a multitude of different types of pests and diseases, because using glyphosate is less for them. Beyond that, I have 13 different studies that are scientific peer-reviewed journal articles from all over the world talking about human health considerations. And they are vast, scary, and strong. So what we're going to do is, um, I appreciate that very much. What we'll do is we'll put together a packet for people, a digital packet, so that they can review them going forward. So why don't we bring up um, some of the Department of Health and uh, District Health officers, and then we'll have questions at the end. We'll have some time for questions in case you're able to do that. But make sure definitely my staff gets those links. For sure. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Next, I'm going to ask um, Director of Health, Mr. Uh, Rosen, to say a few words. Good afternoon, Senator Green, Senator Ruder, Senator Rosen from the Department of Health. I don't have a prepared presentation. I really wanted to just give a little context for uh, the current role of the department, what we might be able to add to the conversation. Uh, the only monitoring for glyphosate that currently is conducted uh, by the Department of on a routine basis is for drinking water. Uh, and I believe that's been since 1996. And those samples have not shown glyphosate in the drinking water except for, I believe, on one occasion, which did look like an anomaly and they thought was probably related to spraying around the pump that the water was coming up from. <clears throat> now again, because that our drinking water is in surface water, it doesn't address the concerns about surface water, but at least it's reassuring that it's not in the drinking water. Um, in terms of surface water, and as has been mentioned, because it is uh, adherent to soil, quickly adheres to soil and particles, 
then you know you might suspect that they could be found in some concentration in surface water or in soils particularly. So uh, I understand that the U.S. Geologic Survey has been conducting uh, a nationwide survey uh, in um, surface waters and, so and sediments to uh, assay for this, and our department is, uh, is doing a small participation in that here in Hawaii. Uh, unfortunately, the results are not ready yet, but we believe they'll be ready sometime in April. And um, with that, although this is sort of a one-time thing right now, it's not part of our uh, routine regulation and sampling, at least we can get more information here locally about sediment and um, surface water, which would potentially, you know, get, also give us more information about whether um, the near shore, you know, aquatic resources might be affected again because the sediment and brown stuff runs off, um, you know, into the ocean. <coughs> um, the other information that I can share with you that comes from the Department of Health, and I understand that many of the concerns expressed here today are for long-term effects and possible association with chronic disease and things like that. But again, you know, it also, uh, acute toxicity has been mentioned. And we do um, have a poison center that serves Hawaii. Um, it's actually the Rocky Mountain Poison Center that takes our calls. And Dr. Bronstein, who is the medical toxicologist and director, is kind enough to put together some quick data on our pesticide calls to the poison center in Hawaii and over the last 12 years. And uh, generally, I can tell you that since 2001 until recently, there's actually been a slight decline in calls to the Poison Center uh, for exposures. Um, and in the 12-year period uh, uh, from 2000 to 2012, glyphosate was the sixth most frequent substance uh, resulting in calls to the Poison Center in the category of pesticides. Which, doesn't, which includes insecticides as well. So the ones that are ahead of that are nanophosphate, which of course uh, you know is a pretty serious uh, potential acute poisoning, and another uh, pesticide, uh, borates and boric acid pesticides, uh, not otherwise classified insecticides, and pyrethroids. Um, and of that, we had, so we had 232 calls in that 12 year period. So not a very frequent source of calling. And as far as the distribution of the calls by county, we found that in frequency, the Big Island had the most calls. Um, and that was 104. And that represented about 11 and a half percent. Let me interrupt you for uh, a second. So I, that is very helpful, actually. So we'll definitely enter that into our kind of our global thing. I, I can supply any of this you want. Yeah, that, I, all of it, because we're going to okay. compile a conversation going forward. Mm -hmm. um, just, in, in just without trying to put you on the spot, and uh, referencing some of the questions that people have brought up and I mentioned earlier, just as to um, you know, tell us about process for cluster of disease and cluster of concerns, not necessarily linking, because I'm not talking about specific links here today, mm -hmm. but is the Department of Health equipped to um, Take in data and concerns, you know, epidemiologic data about clusters of either birth defects or other things that people are concerned about, and then do studies and overlay where we um, have ag chemicals, where we have depleted uranium <coughs> questions, where we have, uh, we've had, Gary and I have had multiple conversations about other toxins in different parts of the state. Um, are we able to do those kind of analyses? Uh, in the Department of Health um, for a chemical like glyphosate? Well, you know, there are several things that I could respond to in that question. I mean, first let's talk about what we call, you know, surveillance or assessment. That's not research or new study. That's just trying to understand the dimensions of health problems that are going on in the community. So if we took birth defects, for instance, which has been a big concern, I've gotten emails about it. Uh, and in fact, I've spoken with two physicians on Kauai who are very concerned about health effects of pesticides. Um, so in the first place, you know, one of the things in that regard with birth defects is unfortunately our, there is a birth defects registry that is not up to date. So although 
It has the capacity to trend birth defects. It's not a study to compare and cause out, but at least tell us are they going up, are they going down, you know, how many do we have. Unfortunately, we are not up to date in that area. But in hearing the concerns, I have been looking at other ways that we can try to shed some light on that, which includes looking at our uh, hospital data, which includes specific diagnoses for specific congenital anomalies, and we can look at the, you know, most of our children are born in hospitals, or if they have a serious congenital anomaly, they will eventually come to the hospital, usually with, if it's a heart defect, and you know, I'm a pediatrician, so I've seen a lot of these in my previous career, they're going to end up in a uh, fairly small group of people taking care of the serious anomaly. So for instance, we only have two pediatric cardiologists in the state of Hawaii. So if we have children born uh, with congenital heart disease, we also kind of have our frontline clinicians to kind of look at that instance. Then we have our statewide uh, database of hospitalizations, which is the Hawaii Health Information Corporation. And I'm starting to work with them to look at using that data to examine the incidence of birth defects by county, and we may possibly be able to look at that by zip code. That but be, let's say, I mean, yeah. I'm pausing. So that would be very helpful because um, whether or not there are concerns about this chemical or many others, I know that um, each legislator gets concerns from their community, and so if they could pass those concerns on to the Department of Health, as we hopefully help you um, get the birth defects uh, surveying uh, capacity back up to date and so on. We know you're very new to the world, which is perfectly appreciated. Um, we want to be able to, you know, bounce off community concern and then uh, off of you and then have a, a reflection of what the science is. Right, you know. so, so it starts with being able to accurately count. Do we have to do more than expected or not? And do we have more than expected in any particular location or amongst a certain group of people? Now, after that, to try to say, well, why are we seeing this, and is it in fact too many, because as you know, many things are random, and yet random events don't occur on a regular basis. So when you talk about clusters, whether it's clusters of birth defects or clusters, let's say, of cancer, well, there's a pretty complicated process to try to sort out, one, is that really significant anymore, is it just a bad year, and then we're going to have a good year. And then next, trying to establish cause and effect. Now, we don't have a lot of capacity to do some of those studies here in Hawaii in general, not just in the health department, but in the medical school in general. And we have a pretty significant limitation in some of these communities that we're trying to study, and it's basically a small numbers problem. It's very hard to do comparisons. But there certainly are um, public health epidemiologic techniques that when we find a cluster, we can start to investigate and look at commonalities that may exist. Uh, and if you have a theory, let's say that it is pesticide exposure, it's something else, you can try to test that theory, you know, by doing sort of case control studies or something like that. Uh, it's not easy to do, and it takes kind of effort, but it, would, it, it does start with trying to identify that there is a problem. So I'm personally opening, open to hearing people's observations. I must say that some of the, the things that I heard today as a physician, I, I'm having a hard time seeing the biological commonality with many of these conditions um, being attributable, but I think it's important to look at it and to continue to uh, follow the, what is limited science perhaps, but then again, there is, as has been described, an awful lot of usage. So that does give you the opportunity to compare communities that probably don't have as much usage with those who have more. You know, I try to look at it that way. Without, and I'm moving from, because we have so many people, I don't want to keep you uh, too long, but without an indictment on any individual chemical, I think the approach that I'm taking as a, as a health policy individual and a provider is we are seeing, it's very easy from, this side of the table and in the clinic to see these broad trends. We get testimony all the time. Bear with me. So we see the trend in autism. We see the trend in allergies. We see all these trends, which we know are trending upward, um, certain diseases without question. So then I say to myself, what are the common things that we're doing in society that are changing society? We are all using cell phones. We are all, because of its effectiveness, seeing in ag, You'd like to say use. We are all seeing um, people, children using, having screen time that's excessive. 
which of these things correlate with which of the, the spikes in concern in some of the health problems. And so it's, a, a hearing like this is not um, meant to solve the question definitively, but I think that we have to now have hearings about, number one, on, this is where we're going to rely on you in the next several years, what are the true spikes in health uh, concern? We know it's diabetes, we know it's uh, um, obesity, as was mentioned quite eloquently earlier. We know it's autism. We know several things have increased geometrically. What overlays with those? And then we go to industry, we go to government, we say, could you please study these things? Let's disavow our concern that these things are connected, or let's confirm once and for all. Uh, we have obviously attention from MIT, we have attention from the Department of Health, we have attention even from the chemical companies. They want, I'm sure, to make sure everything is kosher. Um, so that is the approach. So why don't I move on to the next speaker? Because I, I appreciate that. I think, you know, I actually, you know, one of the reasons I really like working in public health and I'm in this position is because I, I find it interesting to, to do the epidemiology to look at the, the science, and you know, in, in lay terms, it's being a disease detective. Yes. And some of these concerns are just the modern con diseases and concerns that we now face that still have the, the application of public health competencies to these problems is, is an exciting <coughs> area, so I really look forward to looking at it. And the reason I um, asked uh, my colleagues to look kindly on your nomination is I knew that about you that you are interested in getting to the bottom of numbers and interested in the actual health problem. So you make sure that we empower you financially to have these registries up, to have the full scope of epidemiologic concerns laid out, and then we'll see who decides to step up to the table and do the I'll steps. tell you one little factoid that did concern me as our staff was providing me with information about what we could do. The testing for glyphosate in the soil is extremely expensive. I think it costs three to four hundred dollars <laughs> per sample. Yeah. That's going to be a limiting factor, unfortunately. Uh, it, I've talked to them about whether that might be something we could test at the state lab if we actually had different equipment and so not have to, you know, sort of pay as you go. So just keep that in mind. Well, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, this is just my chance to. Um, sure, I think we, we spoke briefly about this the other day, but I just want to. You know, when I saw uh, Dr. Stephanie Senev speak, it blew my mind because I thought I knew a lot about this issue, or I thought I knew a little bit about this issue. But she, and I don't want to mischaracterize her life story or her research, but as I understood her to say, she was studying autism for a long time. And she learned a lot about it, but she was frustrated because she couldn't find, and she was watching the you know, exponential rise in autism in our last 15 years, in her opinion. And she was very frustrated because she couldn't find a mechanism or a, cause, a causal factor until she came across some research about the effect of glyphosate on gut bacteria. And that, that gut bacteria is, is very related, in her opinion, to some of the things related to autism, you know, also obesity and food allergies, some of the other things that have been rising in concert with the with the massive increase in these glyphosates. And well, you know, there are things that we would call an association, cause and effect is very different. And in that regard, as you probably know, uh, it's undoubted that autism, the genesis of autism is prenatal. So again, if you're thinking that it's causing autism in children, you'd really be looking at effects on pregnant women, and you have to say, how does a pregnant woman's gut flora change then you know, cause autism? And as a pediatrician, I've lived through the years of vaccine horror uh, as autism increased, and many, many people were convinced that mercury was the cause of autism. And I, and I think that that's hopefully finally been laid to rest as we've gotten the mercury out of vaccines. But you could find many uh, researchers with pretty good sounding credentials who would get up there and tell you that absolutely autism was caused by mercury. If we chelated children, they wouldn't have autism, and all kinds of things that I was very distressed to see occur. So just because you know pesticide use is increasing and autism increasing is far from as you know, proving cause and effect. But we do need to look at it. And just as with mercury and autism, using studies from across the world 
and cohorts of children being followed and you could compare children who did and did not get vaccines. Because in Denmark, some people wouldn't let their children get vaccines. And they had very good data about what happened to them subsequently in life. These were some of the things that were able to lay that to rest. And I'm not saying there isn't an association here, but there is a lot that you need to look at with that. And also, I'm not familiar with this research, but you do want to see peer-reviewed studies, not convenient studies, or people opining outside of their own field of expertise. So I'd be careful with that. <laughs> Thank you, and I agree. I'm not saying there's a proof of causality, but it seems to me that any neutral party would say, boy, we should look really close to Exactly what I'm saying. We, we this do remarkable need to look at it. And when you have a, a condition as serious and as profoundly affecting to the individual family and society as autism, everybody wants to know what's going on. I certainly do. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do appreciate you saying much. Uh, losing my uh, wingman here, we have to return to the Big Island. Yeah. Self natural food. Some problems. Problem. <laughs> 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 it's great to appreciate it. Uh, Lauren Penn. Thank you. I'll give you a little bit of background about myself, uh, maybe not for you, but for the audience and the filming. Um, I'm not sure if I speak as a public health officer from the Department of Health. They did fund my position, uh, fund my trip here, and uh, so I'll just speak what I think is true. First of all, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my credentials. I'm an honors graduate in chemistry from Princeton University. MD, MPH from Tulane University in 1979, worked 20 years with the World Health Organization, Walter Reed Institute of Research. Uh, my job was to teach and conduct clinical research, human research, on drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. I retired in the year 2000, came back to Hawaii where I, my day job is health officer for Maui County. Last year, I, uh, I assumed the position of uh, professor of medicine Federal University of Brasilia. I'm a consultant to uh, uh, <clears throat> DNDI, Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative. This is a associated arm of Medicine Song Frontiers. They go out to help the poor people and find there's no drugs for them. <clears throat> and I am a committee member for the U.S. Congress who reviews research and they fund it to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars a year. So we form a committee and we review and rank them. I'm telling you this because my area of expertise has always been clinical research, humans. Well, by the time it comes to us and we decide what to do or if we should move forward, or once we move forward, who's marketing their side effects, you realize it comes to making with the product consistently, laboratory tests against the microbes, animal studies, then clinical studies, us, then we market and do post-marketing survey for toxicity. So I get a little bit annoyed when people say, you do the human stuff and we do the animal stuff. We have always looked at the animal stuff. I'm telling you this because we are faced with pesticides. You cannot ethically test pesticides in humans. So you can bring them up, lab, consistently, animal, animal, animal. Then you market it and lo and behold, you hope it doesn't get into the community, either through drift pesticide residue or occupational exposure. When that occurs, we launch another effort called epidemiology. Look at the population, clinical epidemiology, tell me what you think. But we are missing that crucial link of human-human stuff. Fine, that's probably, what we're thinking. Probably could test them on my colleagues here at the Capitol. Just in a kind of a general human test. <laughs> um, now, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I'll leave this with you. These would be my references. Now, so that's what we're stuck with on pesticides. Some key things we learned in this process is that animals are animals, mice are mice, and men are men. And it's very difficult to extrapolate either acute, subacute, which is six months, or chronic toxicity or oncology from one to the other. But we try our best. We choose the best animals we can and move forward. The other thing we learned, and it's come quite relevant, is not even animals are animals. There are toxicological studies of pesticides in mice, rats, chickens, goats, rabbits, dogs, 
and not even mice are rats. So here we are stuck with these limitations. Nonetheless, we have to go forward because somebody's spraying the fields. Now, I'm going to tell you some principles, three or four, that apply whether or not you think these things are toxic or whether or not you think they're perfectly safe. I think these are irrefutable. The first, the first uh, reference. This is a reference by uh, Nash, uh, cancer, the cancer, uh, National Cancer Society plus NIEH, National Institute of Environmental Health, powerful regulators. And these people come up with a claim that drift or occupational stuff or residue is occurring. So no matter how much you follow the package insert, the relative risk these guys are talking about cancer and neurotoxicity is anywhere between two and five fold. Relative risk means if you're the same as a control who never got exposed, it's one. You're the same as them. If it's two, you're double. So these guys are telling us, based on epidemiological surveys, population surveys, you got high risk. Okay, no matter what you say, how you control it, and maybe they don't follow the package insert, but there are risks going on. The next principle we learned is that when you mix two chemicals, whether or not you intended them as a drug or pesticide, when you mix two chemicals, you have quantitative and qualitative different effects, especially in elderly, and you better account for that. Well, what are we talking about? Are we talking about glyphosate? Are you talking about glyphosate or Roundup? Glyphosate is a single chemical. Roundup is a concoction of chemicals. One important one seems to be the surfactant. It goes by the acronym POEA. Then there's AMPA, the byproduct of which seem to have been added to the glyphosate. I don't know why. And just as a matter of discussion here, we are spraying ourselves with a lot of pesticides. Now, you didn't intend for us to breathe them, but we are. In the cane days, 15 pesticides, how many do you think uh, overlap so that we deal with combinations? Let's say 20%, three. How many new combinations are when three overlapping? You got four. Okay. Now we have, because there's a suit under Wayne Kauai, that the West Kauai is sprayed with 90 chemicals, not all pesticides. Let's say 20% overlap, 18. How many new combinations should you, in theory, worry about? 200,000. 200,000. It's almost impossible not to have an effect. Now, if you don't believe me, look at reference number two. These guys are from the publication Toxicology, and they warn you why these things overlap, why we see qualitative, quantitative new things, and they tell you, you be very careful when you take a combination, even Roundup, and it's called reductionist. You say, I know that one, I know that one, I know that one, therefore we'll put them all together and it's okay. That's wrong. That's clearly wrong. The least you can do is test the mixture and stand back and see what we see. So that's kind of like the principles, okay? Now we have, I think you keep alluding to, we have four or five sensational studies talking about toxicity or potential toxicity. Some of these are mechanisms. You know, the director of health, she said, I can't figure out the mechanism, how this would occur, but let's stand back and look. Some of these describe mechanisms. On the other side of the coin, you have the safety guys who keep saying, we got hundreds of thousands, you know, thousands of animals, animals, 200 studies, and it looks all safe. It bothers me that there's a disconnect. So I began to study them one by one, and I'll summarize them real quickly. First study, long-term toxicity, Seralini. He took rats, he gave them BT, I'm sorry, not BT, but Roundup, Roundup corn, and a control, and he followed them two years. The rat model was very prone to tumors, and he said, oh, look at all the tumors. He was soundly criticized because that model had tumors in a lot of them, that model is prone to tumors. And he was criticized left and right. The criticism is longer than his article. But you should know that the Georgetown, Georgetown University scientists agree with Seralini. You did what was correct. And you are pointing to a mechanism which is very worrisome. Also, he did the correct analysis, survival analysis. If every animal is going to get a wide measure of cancer, you look at the time that they got, and he's correct. But soundly criticized. He claimed double standard. You ask of me details that you yourselves, you being the guys claiming safety, don't do. Well, then I pursued reference number seven. This is a summary of 250 pages, 200 articles, and I was shocked 
at the standard these guys use. Seralini is right. He's very hypocritical. You hold him to a double standard. We'll talk about the safety studies later. Seralini's study number two. What he did was, <coughs> sorry, what he did was he shows combinations now. This different study, cells, reproductive cells, placenta, umbe umbilicus, and uh, is it? placenta, umbilicus, and one more, uh, germ kidney cells. And two, glyphosate is quite safe. Two, the surfactant, POEA, quite safe. When you combine them, you see necrosis and you see ap apoptosis, which is pre-programmed death of cells. That's very disturbing, but it proves the combination theory on just two of the combinations, let alone 90 used in West Kauai. Next study, Carrasco. This might interest you. Carrasco is Argentinian. What he did was he took embryo cells of chicks, chickens, and, and um, frogs, and he exposed them to glyphosate. And he saw that the development of the neural crest was so deformed by retinic acid that they deformed facial and cranial deformities consistently. But this is very important because this is what Argentina has been reporting for years. They, he said this matches perfectly to what we see in the population, okay? That they are seeing facial and cranial, they're on the internet, and he reproduced it in chick and frog, what they see in humans. That's the ones who survived. I'm not talking about the ones who didn't make it or burn, or, but yet the safety studies tell us it's okay. Well, how do you, how do you reconcile this, Dr. Bang? I checked this out. What do you think the incidence of these kind of deformities are? It's reported. And I added in genetic malformations, because that could have been genetic. And I calculate we should see 2,000 out of a million per year, or births, per births. We have that many chickens on Kauai, too. Well, <laughs> right? Calculate we see 2,000 out of a million. He is reporting fivefold, 10,000 out of a million. Mm -hmm. Now tell me what our safety studies, adjunctive safety studies, typical EPA safety studies, 40, 50 animals. When they did test it, what they see? Suppose you saw zero. Let's say zero. Zero out of, what do you want to say? Fifth, six, let's say zero out of 40. Do you know the confidence in small numbers? Do you know what you could have missed? You could have missed 10% or 100,000. In other words, what he's saying, the excess of 20,000, five times normal, is well within the scope of this safe study because the numbers are small. When the numbers are small, the uncertainty of your safety is huge. Mm. So now I feel good. I get two studies which seem to be compatible. And when I read all the other studies, I haven't finished, I'm going down by down by down. Small study, 40 to 50 animals, problems, mice and mice. They don't report statistics or the confidence interval of it. It's very disturbing what they do. When they see something significant, that's a red light for me, they dismiss it because the dose finding doesn't correlate. In other words, you try low, medium, high dose. High dose is significant. Oh, but look, low, medium didn't, cre didn't creep up. They dismiss the high dose, or vice versa. Low, medium creeped up, but the high dose wasn't higher. Well, gee, maybe because it's plateaus. I'm very disturbed at reading this last summary of all the safety studies. And the other thing you should know is when you try to read their studies, many of them are unpublished. Monsanto unpublished documents. Just as they criticized Serenini for not being forthcoming, I don't see that deal. But that's not their problem. The problem is the EPA, which bases it on unpublished data. Final study, <coughs> you should know, is number six. This is uh, Jaya Sumana from Sri Lanka. This is what was alluded to for years, maybe decades, ever since Roundup was released in the world, we have seen CDKU, chronic disease kidney unknown origin. Chronic disease of kidney unknown origin. Big thing, big thing. Tens of thousands of severe uh, cases and a high mortality, say 15%, okay. all over the world. So the Sri Lankans, look, published in 2014, uh, 2014, finally think they have it based on epidemiology. They always thought it was hard water. Hard water, hard water. 
So they took out all the chronic diseases, removed the diabetes, removed the hypertension, and looked at this huge chunk which started to occur since the beginning run of Solon World. And they said, look at all the hard water areas. But lo and behold, the areas with the highest, hardest water, no disease at all. And then they pieced it together, Roundup. The area with the highest, hardest water doesn't use Roundup. And if you read this study, and they claim the same is true in Central America, the hardness of the water plus Roundup, you look out for this severe defect. And it's a beautiful study about the chelators, and it, it, it binds the toxic metals. It forms this matrix, delivers it to your kidney, the proximal tubule, releases the toxic chemical, and that's exactly what they see. So these guys are pretty upset. Uh, that's why they kind of ban it, based on an epidemiological study. So I'll just leave it there if you have any questions. And um, small number of dismissed findings, small study. And I just want to leave you with one disturbing thought. You can think about smoking. If I look at all the animal studies, now I know they're animals and not humans, but you have many, many, many small animal studies. 40 animal, 40, 40, 40. You got 250 of them. Okay. What if I took smoking and I broke it up into small studies? I want 1,000 studies of 20 men each. Statistically, nothing's going to show significance. You only got 20 in each. Sometimes it's big. I mean, it's like three times, but hey, that's not statistically significant. What are you supposed to? I'm trying to tell you, a thousand small studies is not like one big study where you lump it all together. To me, that's what the safety studies have done based on animals. Are you saying, Dr. Pang, that um, there's an industry-wide uh, submarining of research by using protocols and procedures that are built to not be able to lead us to any meaningful scientific conclusions? I'm not saying it was intentionally done to mislead. Animal studies can only go so far, but no one really pools 250 small animal studies like I could pool 1,000 small smoking studies and dismiss them all. The other thing that's disturbing is that sometimes the animal study showed something and this one didn't, and they use a negative one to cancel a positive one? That's absurd. I'm sorry, but that's absurd. Now, I'm not finished reading all the 250, but as I go down, I mean, at first, Josh, I was amused. Then I was irritated. Then I was very angry. Because this is what they're claiming. Now, you, I'm sorry, we don't have the human link, but if you want to wait the epidemiological stuff come out, Sorry, it's too late. Yeah, I'm not saying it's misleading. They over-interpreted animal studies. Thank you very much, Dr. Peng. Stick around and maybe we'll get some more questions at time. Thank you very, very much. I have several other individuals. I don't know how many were able to make the trip today. Um, let me go down the list, and if people are here, they can uh, testify. Dr. Dalit Paul is from Kauai. Uh, Aaron Ueno is just the Hawaii District Health Officer. And then, um, let's see, Department of Transportation, Glenn, can I call you up for comments? You're so pleasant and soft-spoken, Glenn, I love having you up here. <laughs> so we don't have any prepared testimony, but we did provide our research of Roundup from our Iris division on several of the neighbor islands, including Oahu. Uh, I don't know if we provide you a copy of our landscaping report. This uh, due to the procedures and the protocols that we follow when we apply and it talks about non windy days, not near waterways, and things like that. But, uh, if you have any other questions, or we have some of the managers here. Yeah, I, let me ask just a couple of basic questions, not, not to interrogate, just to uh, ask, because it, it has come up on several occasions about just um, <coughs> what are our Assuming these are the general protocols, does the, first of all, does the state guide the counties um, in what the usage should be? I mean, how does what's the chain of command on that? No, no. We, we have our own protocol. We don't, we don't with the okay, so you just have the state roads. Okay, that that helps me out a lot. And um, do you get concerns or complaints, or has this not been a major issue for you? I think we've gotten a few complaints. Uh, 
when we spray near the waterways and stuff, so we stop spraying and then we do low pressure spraying and uh, not on the view. So I don't know, you know, the, the complaints have really dropped down. You can join, but if someone wants to, <laughs> <it's> never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we haven't had any complaints. In the three years I've been there, I have, we haven't received one. Okay. And just as a matter of course, just how how necessary is it deemed to be to use um, glyphosate or herbicides in general for maintenance of you know road beautification and so on? It is one of our tools that we use, and without having to use glyphosate, we have to get the crews out there and rewrap them more often. And if we miss a cycle where we let the grass grow and it affects the sight distances of the vehicles and it causes an accident with the liability concerns. So we try to limit the usage to around the guardrails and on the shoulders and like to stay away from the drains, ditches, and the water. If, uh, if we don't use Roundup or types, it will increase our operating costs. So, is it, so as far as non-chemical uh, <coughs> ways to handle this stuff, it's really just be either like weed whacking and manual. Bow it, bow it down. Um, how many places, just so I understand better, how many places across the state is it necessary to use, you know, chemicals? Many. I mean, we use it in a lot of places, on a lot of the highways. Um, well, um, every highway except Kauai. Kauai has tried to stop using it, and I don't know how successful it has been. Okay, we'll ask. I have a councilman from... Yeah, so. Hang on, this is Brad Kinney, our Kauai District Manager. I'm back in Mako at the uh, Highways Wild District. Um, we pretty much use Roundup on uh, high speed areas, freeways, medians, ground guardrails, um, areas that you just can't put people out there. And even if we put somebody on the freeway uh, with the weed there, we um, would have a traffic jam. It's uh, unsafe and you would be out there quite often. Um, pretty much have a five week cycle for, uh, for grass cutting. Well, I, this I don't know, and you'll have to forgive me because I actually honestly don't even drive on a lot. My wife, when she's here, does it. I, I'm a big island guy, right? But <laughs> have we, um, are, as far as median goes and so on, do we also, when we're building the roads, consider things like just gravel or do we just come through there anyway? You, you just have a little bit of dirt in the cracks and you're going to have Okay. All right. But again, you'd reiterate what the director said. Not around waterways, not around high population areas. Well, we have a training program, um, and we instruct them in uh, wind over eight miles an hour. They don't spray um, around certain areas. They don't spray. We actually keep track of where they spray and how much they put down and how often. So we actually track all of that and report it. What would be helpful, since I have Director of Health here today as well, is um, what I'm interested in is over time being able to map to see whether there's a concern or no concern, right? To be able to map the good work you do. Since it seems like you're taking very good records, which is excellent. You know, over time, whether it's from now going forward or back, if it's convenient, to be able to say, okay, this is how much we use in these regions, or these areas of the highway, and when. And then she, over time, can do the epidemiologic studies and say, definitively, one way or not, we've seen spikes in whatever, maybe GI illness or birth defects or whatever people are bringing up. Is that something that you think is doable? I mean, do you, is your record keeping? We just provide this report every... We have this for the last few years for a while only. Okay. We keep track of wherever we spray and how often um, our main report daily. Okay. So now I'm going to spread all our data we have to report and so we track all of them. That's perfect. So we could just provide them with a copy of it. Yeah, so for going forward, if you don't mind, um, let's establish this as a positive result from today. Just begin to share that with Director Rosen uh, monthly. Just send her over an email copy of it. That way she can begin to see whether or not her work can tease out any concerns or non-concerns. But I think that would make a lot of people feel comfortable because I'm, I'm saying this uh, reflecting on the correspondence I get, which is actually pretty significant from part, different parts around the state and a lot of course, a lot more dense on a lot, a lot more people writing emails. So I think that would be great. Have you, um, just since I have you here, have you noticed, have you had any incidents of direct toxicity like to your workers? Have we had any bad examples where unfortunately someone didn't have protective gear and they got very sick? Or have any of our workers had any 
have you noticed, because you're in charge of a lot of people, from kidney disease or any health problems in your teams? Not with our men. We have a pretty strict uh, comprehensive safety program, so we require them to have proper PPE. Okay. Um, what does PPE stand for for the audience? Uh, personal protective equipment, yeah. um, respirators, uh, gas gloves. Um, if we, there is a negative side, at times, um, if we miss a cycle, if it rains or it's windy, we will miss the cycle and we have complaints with grass and growing. And just the nature of it. Okay, that's very helpful. And also, um, I take to heart what you said, uh, Director, um, as far as accidents go, as far as putting people on the roads. But if you could um, tease out some of the data, if possible, I know this is a much bigger project. Um, you know, whether or not, I mean, are, are there actual visual, um, you know, line of sight problems? Have we seen more accidents in areas that? have not had as, you know, as good maintenance of the road. We've had complaints. Uh, years ago, we did have complaints when we did cut back on some landscaping, where we pretty much just took care of areas where we had site distance issues and safety issues. Uh, can I ask just, uh, this is kind of just a, um, a philosophical question, so this has got to be the worst nightmare for you, but the, a philosophical question about just beauty, right? We're in a state that's obviously considered tropical, Setting aside dangers that you cannot see, I understand that. I can see that, that being that's a focus somehow or other at all times. But do people really? Would people really worry if we had more grass, more greenery, even more "quote unquote" weeds on the roads, as opposed to the question of being able to say we don't use any chemicals in our landscape? Mm -hmm. How, have, have we had that discussion at the department level? Because yeah. yeah. I'm not so sure that people. You know, the concept of visiting Hawaii is obviously this this idea in people's minds that everything can be and should be lush and so on. I don't want to diminish the necessary maintenance and safety of the roads. But it seems to me that might not be the worst thing. Some people write me that and say, why spray it? Why spray anything? Why not let stuff grow as long as it's not going to obstruct view? Is that, a, is that a meaningful conversation or is that just, you know? Maybe we can start the conversation. Okay. And I've received a recent complaint where somebody complained about where we had a grass grain in the median of the freeway. There's really no dirt. Yeah. And um, the plastic bags on it. And, and that's what happens when, when grass grows. And even when you kill it, it's still there. It's not you go out to weed or we wait until it just yeah. deteriorates. Well, I kind of would like grass in the median, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, all right. <laughs> For another day. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, so let's see. Let's move on. Did I have anyone from City? Uh, well, I had Tony Robinson. That was uh, okay. Um, let's see. County of Hawaii Parks and Recreation. Anyone from there? Uh, Maui Department of Parks and Recreation. And then Kauai uh, Department of Parks and Recreation. Did anyone else come? to further expand on what the director said. Okay. Um, I have an opportunity to call the councilman up, if I could. Um, would you mind coming up? Sure, for a second. <clears throat> so maybe, Gary, welcome back, Senator, Councilman, and Thank you. whatever comes next. But I, I think, um, I'm pleased to see you. Uh, could you maybe just give us a couple comments about the Kauai question? Because we, didn't, we aren't lucky enough to have um, Dr. Ball here today, but I have noticed more of my health concerns coming out of Kauai lately than any other of the counties. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, Gary Hooser, a member of the Kauai County Council, speaking as an individual council member. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Green, Senator Green, for, for hosting this today. It's a very important discussion, and uh, it's long overdue. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Before I talk about the, the Kauai, too, I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, uh, State Department of Transportation and, and dealing with the Kauai road situation. And I believe they, they stopped the spraying on the roads. And uh, how did you achieve that, Gary? I mean, he mentioned that, and that interested me. Well, the, I don't deserve the credit, even though I get the blame for. You certainly deserve the blame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think it started with with residents on the North Shore Coy. And if you go out there today, on on certain days, you'll see residents weeding the sides of the highways in critical areas, drainage areas on their own behalf, volunteers out there doing it. And I, I just think it came from a, a, a increased awareness in the community, and a lot of calls, a lot of people concerned, and the state listened. 
and has, has responded very positively. And so I'm very happy with that. And there was two issues. One is how much is used, and one is the notification. You know, signage, you know, people want to be notified. If they have to drive down or, or uh, an area, then they want to be notified that we're spraying today, we're spraying tomorrow, so they can avoid those areas if, if they want. Um, I do have some numbers that uh, the Kauai County provided. And, you know, it's, issue on Kauai we've been working on is disclosure. And the, the county and the state were very generous and, and, and good with their disclosure. They offered up the numbers without uh, any problem whatsoever. And to put it in the scope, in the scale here, on Kauai, if you add up all the uh, gly I always in trouble, so <laughs> glyphosate uh, used by both parks and roads, it comes about 1.5 tons uh, when you convert gallons to pounds. And it sounds like a lot, but if you add up the number sprayed by just the four largest uh, agrochemical companies, uh, it comes about 100 tons. Uh, and and then therein lies the problem, I think. I think it's a matter of scale. Several people have talked about that today. It, it's really the quantity that's being used. And on Kauai, the crops that are being sprayed are experimental in nature. And it's an industrial agricultural operation. So there's three or four crops. And so the data might say you, we're using less uh, but they don't say three or four crops, and they're not on experimental crops. A lot of these crops are Roundup uh, ready, and they're designed to take more Roundup. Uh, the, the issue on Kauai, we've been fighting, if you would, uh, for the information. Uh, we, we passed an ordinance requiring disclosure. Uh, the companies that uh, chose to sue Kauai County rather than pr provide that disclosure. Uh, we have a large number of, of uh, residents on the west side who believe uh, that their health and the environment is being uh, negatively impacted. Uh, I've sent you some information, and uh, the Director of Health, I spoke to her outside today, uh, she uh, acknowledged the concern and is going to be looking into that. Uh, it's very complex, as has been uh, discussed earlier, to, to, for direct causation. But we have this intense use, and we don't know really what, what, what's happening. Uh, the, it's interesting that the companies have voluntarily disclosed their restricted use pesticide use. The restricted use pesticides, by law, there's a public record of what's sold in, in the state. So, so they volunteered to disclose what is already public record. And, and we're thankful for that. Uh, we still don't get the, the geographical areas where these chemicals are being used. But what is troubling, and almost more troubling, is we ask, I am asked this question directly, well, how much general use pesticides are you using? You told me they're restricted use. I know that. How much Roundup are you using? And they refuse to um, disclose that information. And when I talk to the Department of Agriculture, who's uh, similar to the Department of Health, very understaffed, under-resourced, and, and don't have the people and the resources to do the job properly, in my opinion. But I asked, well, how much Roundup is being used in the state of Hawaii? And no one knows. So there is no record. Uh, public record of the amount of this chemical being used in our state, and I think that's that's where it should start uh, in terms of legislation. No one knows. No one knows at all. Individuals will know, but, but we don't know. Are you talking about, um, Councilman? Are you talking about all use chemical companies, the amount that's imported into the state, um, so that we can so we can get a gross tonnage estimate of all that's used in our communities, or are you more specifically talking about those larger users, like especially the chemical companies, as you said, 100 tons versus 1.5 tons, for instance, on Kauai? Yeah. I think the, the, the area of focus should be the larger users. There's no question about that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we have no idea now. We have no idea how much Roundup is being used in the state. Uh, individuals in the state and county know how much they use. But we don't know how much these large companies are using or the, or the small companies. And I think that would be a starting point. And I think the community would be shocked uh, to find out what that actual number is. Perhaps we can count the deformed chickens that are running around our <laughs> counties and then begin to extrapolate. Perhaps they would like that if we did that. You know, the, uh, there are you know, from some very serious issues. You know, and, and, I've, and I've seen chickens, and I wonder uh, what they're eating. But, but there are a number of residents 
Okay, we have 150 residents uh, suing uh, DuPont Pioneer and for uh, impacts from dust and pesticides. Okay, this did not happen historically. This is a plantation town. You do not sue your major employer, but the people there are very concerned about their health. Their respiratory illnesses, nosebleeds, <coughs> you know, concerns about heart defect, uh, congenital heart defects and newborns. That's what's been coming to me, uh, Gary. I, you know, I'm, I've been seeing an, a very significant uptick, and maybe it's because of the work that you did and, and um, to some extent what was done on the Big Island and now some of these hearings, but I'm getting a lot more, I'm seeing a, um, a lot more chatter, if you will, from people actually willing to say that they're concerned about this health problem, they're concerned about this health problem, and I have two concerns about that. Number one, the health problems more than anything else. And two, uh, the uncertainty. When a person gets, I'll say this kind of simply, when a person gets a diagnosis of cancer, all right, um, there's two things that happen. One, they've got cancer, which is terrible, and they have to go through treatment and they have to go through pulse. The other thing that's terrible about it is, for a very long time going out, that is one of the only things you get to think about for year after year after year. Your next CAT scan, your next MRI, your next test, the next whether you're in remission or not, whether or not you have a metastasis, the spread of the cancer, it can affect one's entire life. And I think that that I think we should be able to say pretty simply, it can affect the community's entire life cycle if these questions go unanswered. So it's really to your credit that you're pressing this information out. Um, so I think that there are two major questions that we have to address. One, the concrete, are we hurting anybody? We don't want to hurt anybody. And then the second question is the lack of an open, public, transparent dialogue having profound effects on society. And I think that actually, if I may, is why we're seeing a lot of people come out now. That, that lack of transparency, if we could just solve that, I might very well be satisfied. Because I think everyone would agree, God, if something's causing a harm, we're going to, both chemical companies and society, we're going to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But it's that lack of conversation. Could you, could you comment on that? Yeah, I agree 100%. There, there are people, uh, again, my may have who whose children are sick, yeah. and the doctors don't know why, and they look out at these fields, and they, and they know that there's something there, but they, they can't find, they, no one will tell them why. And so it exacerbates the issue uh, and, and causes more fear and more concern. And the only way to resolve this is disclosure, transparency. And uh, the, uh, I, was, I didn't know Dr. Rosen was a pediatrician yeah. by training or by occupation. And I was very happy to hear that. Uh, almost every pediatrician on Kauai uh, signed testimony in support of the bill that we passed. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics issued a report uh, within the last year that specifically recommends that pediatricians support uh, full disclosure and buffer zones around schools, hospitals, and homes. And that, that is a minimum we should do uh, for the, the pesticide issues. Get full disclosure and then take some minor, you know, some precautionary measures around sensitive areas. Uh, in the report, the pediatric, American Academy of Pediatrics report, you know, is clear. Uh, uh, the unborn child and, and young children uh, are the most at risk. And those that live around uh, agricultural areas or live in areas where there's high pesticide use have greater incidences of a wide range, a range of uh, ailments. Can I ask you, uh, Councilman, also while you're here, um, just, we've had over here for a couple hours now, so I thank you everyone for being here today. Um, can you tell me, what when you dig into this issue, I know you dig deep when you go into these issues, what is the primary reason uh, that chemical companies or anybody is reluctant to um, just disclose. Is it because, I, I'm sure there are many pretexts given and many reasons, is it because they don't want to be here, do they not want retaliation, do they not want proprietary information spread, do they say it's not your business, do they say we own the land, what exactly is it that people use as their reasoning for not just saying absolutely this is what we're doing, we're going to test more, we have a lot of money, we're rich beyond rich, we're going to make sure we do everything we can for safety, let's be partners. What is it that they do? The, it's really hard to, 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 to know the real reasons, quite frankly. Uh, we had countless hours of hearings and, and spoke to the chemical company executives, just like we're talking right now, right. and I asked them the very same question. Uh, and they would talk about trade secrets. And I would say, well, we're not asking for trade secrets, we're just asking for how much Roundup are you using? that type of thing. Uh, 
And then at one point, there was a gentleman, uh, uh, Kirby Kester, an uh, executive with one of the companies, and I asked, I asked Kirby, uh, Mr. Kester, I said, you know, why don't you just give it up, retire fighting, just agree to disclosure, that's all we want, it's a modest buffer zone. And he said to me, and this was on camera, this is, he said, Councilman, you don't understand, there's more than just, more implications that we're concerned about other than just the law. And I said, what implications are you concerned about besides the law? And he said, you're concerned that other communities might want to do the same thing. Okay, uh, and that's uh, straight, we've got that on tape, that's what he said. Uh, Pure they, precedent, they do not want disclosure right. in Iowa, Pennsylvania, and everywhere. And they don't want, they believe, I'm sure in their hearts, that they're highly regulated. Uh, but when you deal, when you deal, drill down into it, you find out they're not really that highly regulated. Uh, the Department of Agriculture is understaffed. Uh, they're years behind in, in following up on inspections and complaints. Our department or our, our department of agriculture. Uh, years, years behind, and then I can send you that information. Uh, we asked an, an inspector one time, "Do you ever find evidence of drift?" Uh, and they said, "Yes, we find it." And then we said, "Well, what do you do when you find that evidence?" Well, we send it out and have it tested. Well, do you notify the public? No, they don't notify the public. Well, when do you notify the public? Well, when the tests are back and confirmed. And how long does that take? Two years. And so not, they don't have the resources. Uh, <laughs> and, and then the public's only notified if the public asks to be notified. Uh, so they're not highly regulated in my community and in our state. Uh, it might look like it on the surface, but, but they're not. Uh, if you look at, uh, and I've got records, the, the inspection records, uh, almost half the records are redacted because of violations and we don't know what those violations are. And again, it, uh, we have good people trying to do the best they can with, with uh, very little resources and companies that uh, have far more resources uh, than we do. And if I may, because uh, I'll summarize a, a point of thought you're, you've been giving me, reporting <laughs> would be your first step. Comprehensive transparency. You've had a lot of experience with this issue now. I don't want to be throwing darts and hitting the wrong targets if we if I get a chance. You'd start there? Absolutely. I mean it's all about transparency. We can we cannot know Kauai County, somebody needs to do a study. We talked about the heart defects, we talked somebody needs to do epidemiological studies. Someone needs to study this issue to determine whether or not harm or what degree of harm to environment and health is happening. You cannot do a study without disclosure. In the end of story. You you cannot study if you don't know what to study. And, and that is the frustrating uh, thing right now with, in Kauai County. And I do think we will ask, because we do have a director here, and I know you're in constant communication with her as well, um, we will ask for those um, beefed up epidemiologic surveys, especially around areas that you designate to her, and I may or may not be able to tease out of you know, my community. I think that's another good place for us to start. And then over time, when we get that data, we'll be able to overlay it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for doing this. If I may, just so I'm not rude to anyone, um, was there anyone that I included on the um, on the agenda that did come over to to Honolulu today to make comments that I didn't uh, call up? Okay. Well, I'll tell you. Um, just really quickly, so please come up to the. Yes. Only because if I don't have you up front, then I can't. Everyone can't hear you. My apologies, but in an effort to keep my conversation and talk in 10 minutes, I left out the second half, which is included environmental and health concerns. I think that was discussed fairly, fairly well. But in conclusion, uh, and to, to let you know, and it's in, in sympathetic for the PowerPoint, yes. I did have eight alternatives that we sent to the county and the state that they could use. To, um, Take a few moments. Go ahead. If you don't mind? Yes. Okay. Oh, I could read them off as well. Yeah. Which, whichever is best. Read them. Well, I'd like to read them off. Yeah, go ahead. And these have been presented to the county and the state of and, and county of Hawaii and the state. What we really want the county to do is eliminate the use of Roundup and chemical herbicides as the primary tool. That's all we're asking for, for controlling undesired vegetation and roads. Um, let natural reef vegetation occur along roadways. This is a method used throughout the United States. It's used on Palau, it's used on Guam, it's used on Saipan, it's used on Panape. All these islands get a high amount of rainfall. Very little. Um, very little chemical is used outside in the Pacific Island areas. Um, the counties and state maintain the areas simply by mold. And I can understand the guardrail thing, I, I kind of get that. Um, New Zealand, I believe, is <coughs> using pretty much exclusively um, high hot water spraying machines. Um, and it seems to work quite well. 
from what I've read about it, it kills the, not only the plant uh, tissue above the ground, but the root as well, like, like uh, Roundup does. Another alternative is a third to water, vinegar, a two thirds water mixture. Okay? I don't know. I, I've heard that does work. I haven't tried it myself. I know the hot water works on. The other day I went out with uh, my teapot you know, and, I, and I sprayed a crack. I, mean, I poured it over a crack. Three days and vegetation was dead. And this, this is what I think is really important, especially in residential areas. We can start it right now. Require landowners in residential areas to maintain the right of ways. Stop spraying, especially in res residential areas. Right now, there's no, there's no reason to spray in residential areas. This also is used in the vast majority of the U.S. Um, if, if, a, if a landowner does not maintain it, then the county can charge. Okay, we're going to come in and mow that for you, but we're going to charge you 100 bucks, whatever. Um, flame torches, once again, traffic is an issue. But flame torches, you walk along the crack, you spray with a flame torch, it works. And, and many, many municipalities use that flame torch. Mainly, what I want to see happen is eliminate the use of high pressure sprayers. I don't know if the state's use it, but the county are. The county is. And that's where we're really getting the drift issues. On the mainland, in order, in a couple of things they've done to reduce the amount of runoff going on lands and to reduce the amount of drifts, they, they use a wick system. So instead of spraying, um, they basically have a wick system where runoff is applied through this wick. It touches the plant <coughs> and the plant. So, so we're, not, we're not suggesting them a complete elimination of runoff. Just start using a little more wisely. Um, and the other thing is use a combination of all these things. Okay? Once again, I would reiterate the, the need for education. We have plenty of tools in our toolbox, and we don't have to rely exclusively on, on Roundup. So yes. you have a copy of this, and as I said, the county and the state also does. So we hope to be able to um, encourage both the state on the big island and the county to look at our alternatives. But we will, uh, just for one thing, because you come from Kona, and I, I think I'm honor bound to, you know, to act on my own constituents' best ideas. We will be forwarding your ideas with a re-emphasis on them to each of the counties and to the mayors, uh, particularly Mayor Pinoy. So we, Billy's very responsive usually when we when we have issues <coughs> back and forth that across county and, and state boundaries. So we'll ask him uh, and them in general to consider these uh, methods. I think that it makes a lot of sense that wherever we can use any non-capital, first of all, they'll be a lot less expensive, which is always a consideration I know that the, uh, the mayors have. But secondly, I think it will be very interesting as we begin to um, press the counties. That's why it was important to have the Director of Transportation here today to emphasize that, yes, from a safety standpoint, we're willing to explore some latitude and, and you know, be careful. You're, they're pretty transparent, frankly, and they, that study was here right in front of us about where they're using it. So there's no question that the county and the, and the city and the state are able to do that. But um, it would be a real neat thing to see them adopt some of the natural modalities um, for for, you know, vegetation control. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Come on. Thanks. So everyone, I think we've had you here uh, long enough. Um, I greatly appreciate your input. I would like just to say this. Um, the purpose of this kind of hearing, you're going to see a lot more of these in the next four years, about issues that um, should be raised in public, whether or not they each result in a direct connection to health, I don't know and I can't say. but. I think it's important where we have um, large public health questions and large environmental health uh, practices and where there's some nexus that we explore all the different possibilities. And I hope to be able to do what we did today, which is get a lot of people in the room, experts from the community, from the scientific community, and from the different departments who I don't think spend a lot of time together. Um, not because they don't want to, but because they're all overwhelmed with their own niches. But the idea just to have someone like you um, come together, you know, to have you, Jeff, being able to communicate in a similar space, in the same room with a director of health, director of transportation, and them to know what some of these questions are coming from the community, how they overlap, overlap I think that could actually expedite some of this work and some of this research. Um, otherwise, it's going to be really complicated to get to solutions. And to the extent that we can have experts come together, um, like Lauren and Andrea, and to provide us with that, you know, a more distilled version, I mean, a distilled version like you gave us today, because it's impossible for anyone in government to go through all, you know, this gigantic amount of literature. Get that to the departments at, at the university, or get it directly to me 
and I will disseminate it to those directors in these hearings, it will be really greatly appreciated. In other words, we're asking you for free labor on behalf of, <laughs> on behalf of the human race. So <laughs> it should be worth it. And I know, um, I want you to know how much I appreciate it. And uh, other colleagues have expressed that kind of appreciation to me too. But we're going to have a, a great, a greatly increased amount of openness and transparency on these questions. And I encourage the chemical companies to, to join in. And I encourage the communities to welcome that input. And rather than an adversarial relationship in the future, perhaps we'll be able to reach a situation where transparency and good health uh, environmental policy wins the day. So thanks, everyone. Um, expect follow-up uh, sometime probably in the fall, I would guess. Please do uh, send all of your PowerPoints and presentations or best thoughts to my office. Uh, we, will, we will keep uh, records. We'll keep it and we'll put it online for people or we'll make it available anytime because I think some of the best ideas will come from the community. Thanks, everyone. We'll turn. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, that's it. We're live. Thanks a lot. We were live.